Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day. If you are interested in true crime stories like I am, I hope that you consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Today, we're going to be talking about a five-year-old Phoebe Johnchuk. Phoebe was such a beloved child. Her mother, father, grandparents, everybody loved Phoebe, and she was a ha she lived a happy life. I wish I could end our story right there. Phoebe lived a a happy life, but that's just not reality. One night, Phoebe's dad took her for a drive in the cool night air. Her beloved father, who loved her so very much, would be her biggest betrayer. We have to pull back the facade of her happy life and see the worst. So let's talk about Phoebe in the horrible night on the Tampa Bay Bridge. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thanks to MD Hair for sponsoring today's video. MD Hair has been a longtime partner of this channel here. I believe in their products and its effects. But if you are not aware of who MD Hair is, they are the world's first medical grade hair regrowth treatment customized to the exact cause and type of your hair loss. Their products are cruelty free and the products ship directly to your home. All customers receive unlimited access, one-on-one -on -one chat support with a dermatologist and free fine tuning of the medications formula 24 seven. How I got started, I went to www.mdhair.co.com and filled out a short quiz about my hair concerns and lifestyle to get an instant analysis. The instant analysis is amazing. Their technology is unreal. Give them an image and you get an analysis of your hair back. Like, I don't know what kind of hocus pocus it is, but it truly is amazing. It's simple and easy. My major concerns were thinning hair and itchy scalp. Some of it may be from just getting older, but that's not changing anytime soon. So I need a hair regimen that helps improve my hair and keeps it strong and healthy. Your hair concerns may not be the same. It's not a one size fit all. So MD Hair will customize to your needs. I have been using the products for how many months now? Four or five months now? Here's a picture before and here's a picture today, which I still need to do, which I will do shortly. It, there is no more itchy scalp. I know that the longer I use the product, the more it'll improve. I have hair extensions in right now, but I can tell where the regrowth has come in, where my ends are like really thin and then it's thicker up here. So I'm trying to cut the ends as much as possible to keep it going, but uh, uh, extremely impressed with the products. The products are affordable, they don't dry out your hair, and they actually smell good and it foams up nicely. Customize your hair re growth treatment with MD Hair. Use my promo code FLOWER70 to get your first month of customized products at 70% off. And here's my link. Check the description box as well. I will have a pinned comment with the link. Thanks to MD Hair for making today's video possible and thanks to all you guys for listening. Just after midnight on January 8th, 2015, Officer William Vickers of the St. Petersburg Police Department had just finished his shift and was driving home. He was driving on Interstate 275 South towards Sunshine Skyway Bridge when a driver in a white Chrysler PT Cruiser flew right past him. Even though he was off duty and headed home, he was still in a marked police vehicle and the car was going, this PT Cruiser was going over 100 miles an hour. So he followed the PT Cruiser as the driver approached the top of the Dick Miser Bridge and the driver pulled over. Vickers had not put his flashing lights on, his flashers on, because he said it was never safe to do a 
traffic stop on top of a bridge. He was waiting until the vehicle got to the other side. As Vickers pulled over behind the PT Cruiser, the driver got out of the car. Officer Vickers got out as well and told the man to freeze where he was. The man started to approach him, so Vickers pulled out his gun. The driver will later find out was a man named John Junchek Jr. He told Vickers, John told Vickers, you have no free will. Then he continued walking around to the back of the car to the passenger side. Vickers said John opened the passenger side door and reached inside. The officer was worried John was reaching for a weapon. Little did he know, but John was actually the weapon here. Instead, he reached into the back seat and grabbed his sleeping five-year-old daughter, Phoebe, out of her pink booster seat. He held her up like a little baby with his arms under her legs and one, you know, under her head in one motion. He turned and dropped her off the side of the bridge. The officer was close enough that he heard her scream as she fell the 62 feet into the frigid waters below the bridge into the Tampa Bay. The screams that will show up in that officer's nightmares for probably his lifetime. The officer said John quickly got back into his car and fled the scene. The officer ran to the edge of the bridge where there was a ladder down to the, the catwalk below and he climbed down. He would later testify that he shined his flashlight back and forth. He called for the little girl, but he never saw her. She had been quickly swallowed up by the bay and moved away in the choppy current. A search and rescue alert was issued for the little girl Phoebe and brought in local Coast Guard helicopters and boats. St. Petersburg Fire Department had a boat searching. Even the local Eckerd College who got a call in the middle of the night had a boat of students in the water searching within minutes. Vickers had walked the catwalk looking east to west and he continued searching by joining the fire department rescue team. About 90 minutes later, Phoebe's body was found half a mile from the bridge by the college students, which is so sad. They started CPR on her and met with the fire department's boat where Officer Vickers took over the scene. Phoebe was taken to the local hospital by life flight. When she was originally brought to the hospital, her temperature was only 44 degrees. They tried internal warming with heated IV and warming blankets. Her temperature was only brought up to 75 degrees before she was then pronounced dead at 2.44 a.m. Heartbreaking. This poor little girl. When John left the scene, he drove north towards Tampa. Several officers were following with lights on, trying to get him to stop. He did a U-turn and started driving south in the northbound lane so that he was driving into oncoming traffic. Like, he was a serious danger. He was able to avoid cars and finally pulled over in the medium. Four officers pulled him out of the car at gunpoint. He refused to follow the orders of the officers completely. He just gripped the steering wheel and stared straight ahead. He was placed under arrest and taken to the police department. While waiting for the investigators, he was very calm. He asked for a lawyer, so there was no questioning. No questioning was done. He was taken to jail and charged with first degree murder. It seems like we are moving really fast because everything happened really fast. So let's back up and talk about how the heck did we get here? Phoebe Jade Johnchuk was born on August 22, 2009 in Tampa, Florida to her mom, Michelle Kerr, and her dad, John Jr. She also had two older half-brothers by her mom. When John met Michelle, he was only 17 years old and Michelle was 23. They weren't married, but they lived together off and on for about six years and their relationship was extremely volatile. Many times, the police were called to their house to break up physical fights between them and then typically one of them would get arrested. Usually the charges were dropped. Michelle was 
then diagnosed with MS. After being diagnosed with MS, she was approved for disability because she couldn't work enough to support herself and she had to give up driving as well. When the two of them split up, John moved out with Phoebe. While they had a verbal joint custody agreement, it was clear that Michelle couldn't take care of Phoebe and John could. Sometimes John and Phoebe would live with his mom, which is another Michelle. Other times they would stay with John's dad, we'll call him senior, and his wife, another Michelle. <laughs> She goes by Mickey, so that should be a little bit easier, but there is three Michelles. He married a Michelle, his mom's Michelle, and his stepmom's name's Michelle. <laughs> There's a lot of Michelles and Johns. John uh, Jr. was born in 1989 in Tampa, Florida to his mom, Michelle, and dad, John Sr. His mom and dad were together for a short time and then they got married just before she gave birth to John. They were only together for about two years before they divorced and Sr. left the area traveling for work in construction. He testified that he ended up with custody of John Jr. when he was four because his mom was having issues with substances and the law. Their relationship also was very volatile, mostly because he claimed she spent his paychecks on getting high. John's mom couldn't take care of him, so she gave him to Senior. Eventually, Senior and John returned to Tampa where Senior met and married Mickey. Although before Mickey, Senior didn't take care of John, his testimony was that he had to work or he was busy working. Like you couldn't take care of a child and work at the same time. It's not easy, don't get me wrong, but most people do that every day. When he got back to Tampa with John, he started leaving him with people, with his parents, with her parents, his mom's brother, Brian, and his partner. They were a family and they loved him, but John was an angry child. And I wonder why. I'm sure being bounced around like a ping pong ball did not help. He was kicked out of daycare at five and the school system insisted he get counseling because he was explosive. He was the kind of kid that had to get his way and when he didn't, somebody was going to pay. He would sabotage a teacher's belongings or push a student down the stairs. The doctors only diagnosed him with ADHD and put him on appropriate meds for that. Family members, like his uncle Brian, do remember taking him to therapy, but those records aren't available anymore, so we don't know if he had any different diagnosis. When he was 12, he attacked his father, but he said it was in self-defense. There was an instance when he was 17, when he ended up on the roof of his dad's house with a machete, apparently trying to do some sort of self-harm. His father had him Baker acted, which just means he was committed to a mental facility for an evaluation and then kept him until he was no longer a danger to himself or to anybody else. During the trial, many psychiatrists talked about John's explosive anger and the flip side, which was manipulation. He would regularly ask his mom or Mickey for money and if they said no, he would just completely explode. Although he had anger issues, not one witness said he ever was mean to his daughter Phoebe. But friends and family all agree that John used Phoebe. Because of Michelle's MS diagnosis, she also got a check from the state for Phoebe. John used Phoebe's checks, which would make sense because he was the primary physical custody person, so he would need to pay for her care. However, friends and family told investigators that John used those checks for drugs and fun, 
whatever he wanted, basically. Hell, even John told the evaluating psychiatrist that he used her checks for drugs. The problem was he wouldn't make sure that he had a place to live or food first. Then he would call friends and family and use the fact that he had a child and was homeless and could they come and stay there with them. So very manipulative. I'm going to use all my money for drugs and then cry that I don't have anywhere to go. His lack of having a place for he and Phoebe to live wasn't always money related. He would have a fight or be argumentative with the people, family, or friends he was staying with, so he'd end up grabbing Phoebe and leaving. He was a man who held grudges and any kind of slight could send him over the edge. A month before the murder, he and Phoebe's mom had a fight where he tried to get a restraining order against her and at the same time, she said he hit her on the head with the cinder block. The order was denied. Between 2010 and 2014, John was arrested for DV multiple times. These were all on Phoebe's mom. There were also times he assaulted his own mom when he didn't get what he wanted. John had a long history with the law, but the charges were always dropped. Prior to Phoebe's death, he'd only been convicted of reckless driving, which is really surprising knowing his temper and what he did to Phoebe. Reckless driving to murder? In August of 2014, John reached out to a family law attorney, Genevieve Torres, to see about a custody agreement. The first meeting was basically an evaluation of the circumstances, but no papers were filed because at that time, according to John, Michelle Kerr wasn't a threat. John reached out to Phoebe's mom so they could get together around Thanksgiving time because he wanted Phoebe to be a part of his daughter's life, he would claim. John and Phoebe had dinner at Denny's with Michelle, her two older sons, and Michelle's new boyfriend, Guy Kisser. Everyone, including John, said they had a good time. Again, at Christmas time, John reached out to Phoebe's mom to have them all together. This family gathering was at Michelle Kerr's house. Though technically by now, Guy was living there as well. By all accounts, this went great, but the circumstances had changed as Michelle had someone living with her and was engaged. After the murder, the issue of the fact that Guy could drive was addressed. See, Michelle wasn't really a threat to John's custody of Phoebe until she met her man, Guy. They got engaged and started living together. Now Michelle Kerr wasn't at the mercy of John anymore. She didn't have to wait for John to agree to something and then drive to her. She was able to go places and possibly pick her daughter up from school or to have visits. But John had a habit of telling her that she couldn't see her daughter unless she gave him whatever money he was asking for at the time. And she had always been easy to manipulate because she wanted to see her daughter. Christmas with the John Chuck family was an amazing time for Phoebe as well. Of course, everyone doted on her. She was only five at the time. However, John's mom later said that he made a comment about everybody, quote, loving the baby more than him. At the time, she did not take the jealousy seriously because it never entered her mind that John would ever hurt Phoebe. He never had in the past. Many psychiatrists talked about how John's mom being sober at the time, which she hadn't been when he was younger and was a completely different person, she was a better person now by all accounts in Phoebe's life, was hard on him. Part of me thinks it's natural to be jealous of this. Why weren't you this way with me when I was younger? But it was more than resentment for John. He wanted to what looked like to make her pay or revenge. Most of us just want our parents, the grandparents, to love our kids. But John had practically no bond with either parent during those young years, those very important years. 
he liked to withhold Phoebe from his mom to punish her. So that should tell you something. On December 31st, he called the custody attorney to set up an appointment. He said it was urgent, so they were going to meet that next week. About a week before the murder, John had become fixed on a Bible of Mickey's, his stepmom. He'd never shown an interest in religion before. She let him borrow this old Swedish heirloom Bible. On January 3rd, John's uncle Brian got some strange text from John. He was talking about drywall being Chinese and that Phoebe's eyes were looking weird and they were some kind of black markings on the walls. John's mom checked Phoebe's eyes and her eyes were fine. On January 5th, John stayed over at his mom's where Phoebe had been staying. At three in the morning, John stormed into his mom's room, waking both her and Phoebe. He started yelling at his mom, calling her a piece of shit. He was saying some weird things, but everything was intended to hurt her. Apparently, John's mom had been hurt by her own mom as a child, and he knew this. In the middle of the night, John said, it wasn't me who SA'd you, it was only your dad and your granddad. He told her he was taking away the one thing that she loved the most. He said Phoebe didn't deserve to be pushed around like a hot potato. He said he was taking his daughter and leaving. He told her that he was going to Senior and Mickey's house. Before he left, he also told her, I'm going to fuck up your whole world. He succeeded. He really did, unfortunately. Now, when asked during the trial about this, his mom said that John had been mean before. He'd yelled and even went as far as to beating her up before. That night, when he said he was going to, quote, fuck her whole world up, she thought, he meant was going to mess with her probation. Before this, he had threatened to go behind her back and putting something in her coffee so she'd fail a mandatory urine test. Yeah, she said his MO was revenge for sure, but never once did she consider his own daughter would be hurt. On January 6th, John and his second meeting with the custody attorney, weirdly, he did ask her to do a paternity test and she did not ask why. She's like, well, maybe, mm, okay, you know. She, she, he'd never mentioned it before, but all of a sudden he wants a paternity test. She told him that for her to do the filings with the court, he would need to pay the court cost, which he could drop off with uh, her paralegal anytime. But as soon as the attorney walked into the office the next morning, John was on the phone and wanted to come in. Even though they did not need a meeting, she told him that she could see him around 10 a.m. When he arrived, he had Phoebe with him and he was still in pajamas. The paralegal would later testify that she immediately greeted the little girl and asked her dad if Phoebe could stay in color while he was in his meeting with her boss. John told her that he wanted Phoebe to go upstairs to see the attorney, Miss Torres, with him. When he got to her office, he removed a huge Bible from his backpack and sat it on her desk. He then told her, when Phoebe touched the Bible, she began chanting and singing. The attorney said that she was afraid he was going to ask Phoebe to do just that, so she shut it down immediately. She was extremely uncomfortable, so she asked John if Phoebe could go down and sit with the paralegal so she could color while they talked. He finally agreed. After Phoebe was gone from the office, she tried to nudge things back to normal, but then John tried to explain more, saying he believed Phoebe spoke in tongues when she touched the Bible. The lawyer tried again, this time by bringing up the paternity paperwork. He, he instead told her that he believed she was Saint Genevieve, this attorney is Saint Genevieve. Her first name was Genevieve, and this caught her completely off guard. He repeated he believed she was Saint Genevieve 
who had just returned from Babylon. She insisted she had only been to Montreal <laughs> when recently out of town and was not a saint. Then he said that she must be God. He kept saying she was the creator and that she speaks all languages, including Swedish. She said none of those things were true. He asked her repeatedly to read the Bible to him, and if she refused, then she wasn't God. She agreed. You're right, John. I am not God. Such a nice compliment, I guess. He said that he, when it's a she, she's a she, but he said he must be a God, and he still needs her to read the Bible to him to reinstate his beliefs in mankind. Not a pronoun issue, just a bit of wacky talk, basically. He talked about an angel named Michael that is coming soon. She looked at the clock, gasping for anything that she saw, and she noticed that the time was 1040. She knew he had an appointment for him and Phoebe to get baptized at 11 a.m. That was her way out, and let me tell you, she could not get him out of her office fast enough. She convinced him to pack up his things, telling him that he needed to hurry and make his appointment. You know, you got to get out of here when he was leaving. He asked if he, she could drive him, but she convinced him that he could drive himself. He also asked if she could leave Phoebe, if he could leave Phoebe there. She convinced him to take her since they both had an appointment. Now, she had no idea what was coming up. He's just, can I leave my daughter here? You, I, I don't blame her. And the appointment truly was for both of them to get baptized. So it, it, she had already planned on calling 911 the minute that he left. She later testified she was truly afraid and just wanted him to leave. Immediately after John left, she did indeed call 911 and told the dispatcher all about the details of her appointment. She said he's out of his mind and he has a minor child with him. He's driving to a church now and I should have kept the child. Like she had some guilt about not keeping the child after they left. She told them that John was on his way to St. Paul's Catholic Church. It would be his first visit. At trial, Father Bill from St. Paul's testified that 10 minutes into their visit, he was told police were there to speak to John and Phoebe. Two Hillsborough County Sheriff's deputies, Jessica and Aaron, spoke to John and Phoebe. They later said that John knew the day of the, the week. And he was aware of his surroundings and answered all the questions appropriately. They said Phoebe was, quote, smiling and apparently healthy properly closed and happy, unquote. John said he wasn't on any medicine and then saw a doctor regularly. The priest told the officers that he did not believe that John was dangerous. The officers said that they found John was not a threat to himself or others. Immediately after they left, they called the attorney and let her know that they had no grounds to Baker Act him. Remember, that is when you can take a person in for a mental health evaluation and then held until they're no longer danger. Well, how John turned it around so fast for the officers is truly remarkable. After the meeting with the deputies, John called Ms. Torres's office five times in about 20 minutes. Each time he spoke to Miss Malcolm, which was the receptionist. Paralegal, she was a paralegal. Uh, but we'll put a pin in that, we'll come back. Um, because the police couldn't do anything and John had scared her further with his phone calls, Miss Torres also made a call into CPS hotline. She went through all the details from the visit, the bizarre talk with the Bible that John believed that the child was speaking in tongues. She also advised that he had wanted a paternity test done, but in the last phone call in his office, he told Miss Malcolm that the test was no longer necessary. After tomorrow, it won't be necessary anymore. Interesting. The day before, he's saying that I no longer need it because after tomorrow, it's no longer necessary. What does that tell you? 
that sounds like premeditation to me but anyways the hotline operator wrote in her notes that this call referred to more of john's mental state not the child's safety then she re she marked it down as inadequate supervision and closed the call closed the case altogether she didn't speak to a supervisor she didn't refer to a caseworker nothing but Florida CPS did investigate their hotline and their policies after Phoebe's murder. Well, we'll get to that too. As I said, John was charged with first degree murder and originally he was found not competent to stand trial. Eventually he was found competent and went to trial where he pled not guilty by reason of insanity. At the trial, there were many things the defense tried very hard to keep from the jury. One of those things was his criminal history. The jury was only told about his reckless driving conviction and even the doctors that evaluated him couldn't refer to his many DV arrests. Another thing was the fact that John knew Phoebe couldn't swim and that she had to use arm floaties and still wanted to be held by an adult because she was afraid of the water. John's mom was allowed to testify only that she uh, told him in the past that Phoebe needed swimming lessons. The medical examiner testified Phoebe's cause of death was drowning with a contributing cause of hypothermia. He was very limited in how many photos he could show to the jury. One photo showed her backside, which was one big bruise from hitting the water. The doctor was asked if that meant that she was alive when she hit the water and he answered yes. When the psychiatrist weighed in on John's mental state, it seemed the sides did, they did agree for the most part. Both sides agreed he had bipolar disorder and they also believed that he had adult ADHD. However, the doctors from the state also believed he had antisocial personality disorder and he rated high on the psychopathy test that he was a psychopath but the judge ruled it was too prejudicial of a term to be used they are not calling him an asshole which he was but rather a medical diagnosis psychopath isn't slang in the professional in a professional setting. That was the same reason his violent past was kept from the jury. It was too prejudicial and they were only supposed to be judging him on what his state of mind was the night of the bridge. The psychiatrist tried to argue that to figure out his mind that night, they needed to study his whole life. You can't judge somebody on one day. John told one of his psychiatrists that what happened that night was that both he and Phoebe needed to die or the entire world would go to hell. He said he was hearing the voice of Satan telling him this. The problem was is that only Phoebe died. John instead took many police officers on a chase. The psychiatrist said that meant John wanted to live, live and not go to jail. Also, the doctors for the state didn't believe John had any kind of psychosis that night at all. They believe he killed Phoebe to keep her away from her mom and his own mom. One psychiatrist from the state believed John had been experiencing some kind of psychotic symptoms in the week prior, but was not insane. While the other one reminded the jury that John had admitted to using very strong hypnotic substances very recently and those could cause psychotic symptoms. The phone calls that John made to his attorney's office were something that the defense really didn't want allowed in. The first call he told Miss Morgan that he was related to the Pope. The second call, he told her he didn't believe Phoebe was his daughter because his father had an affair with, his, with her mom. He said he didn't know what to do anymore. On the third call, he said he wanted to protect her from all the craziness. On the fourth call, he said, I don't know what I would do without her. If I can't have her, then no one else will. And the last call, he told her, she could cancel the DNA test. Everything was fine. After tomorrow, none of this matters. 
the defense got the last two statements withheld from the jury. Frustrating, but in the end, it really didn't matter. The jury deliberated for almost seven hours and then came back with a guilty verdict. He was given a mandatory life sentence without parole. He filed an appeal for a new trial, but it was denied. But just to talk about Phoebe, goodbye, sayonara, John. You are a POS. Beautiful Phoebe was in kindergarten at Cleveland Elementary School. She had such an impression that her teacher and her principal went to visit the family for two hours after her death. They told funny stories about how she was a warm, welcoming child who was a bit of a jokester. Phoebe loved princesses, her baby doll Lucy, and wanted to be a dancer. Her family held a press conference to tell the world that Phoebe had a happy life and she loved her father and no one saw this coming. Michelle Kerr, the mom, has a lawsuit against Florida's DCFS. They did suspend the worker who spoke with the attorney and the one that basically ignored the call. They instituted a change that if a call came into the hotline where the parent is exhibiting psychotic symptoms, a social worker must have a visit with the family within four hours. A change is nice, but isn't it common sense to do this? I mean, even if it's not in four hours, like before this four hour rule, like in a week, a couple of days, like just check up on them. Granted, putting a time limit of four hours is an improvement, but common sense should have prevailed to get someone out there within any time frame. Some action is better than zero, just to make sure that the child is safe. But I guess that is why she was suspended is because of this. I don't claim to have all the answers and hindsight of course is 2020. But I do wanna give praise to the attorney that took time out of her busy day to make calls on Phoebe's behalf. She truly is a rock star to me. This case was especially heartbreaking because she loved her dad and for him to just throw her off a bridge. Anyway, I won't recap the whole story, but it is just got to me. It's like, wow. Especially seems like it really seemed like it was a revenge on his mom, which is just evil. Anywho, let's leave a pink heart in the comments for little Phoebe and her surviving family that she loves so much. I wish them luck with their lawsuit because hitting them in their pockets seems to be the only way to get change to happen. Thanks to all my channel members and my Patreons who continue to support me. If you would like to become a channel member, you can do so by clicking the join button from your desktop, or there's a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you've made it to the end, you are a rock star, and I love you to death. There are more true crime stories in my Crimey Cases playlist for you to check out. Stay safe, my loves, and remember, if you see something, say something. Bye.